And then also uh, with CSC, so just a few updates from us. We've um, uh, formalized the dates for the conference in 2025. We will be in Montreal again, February 10th to 13th, if you missed that on the latest um, uh, May update from CSC. Um, so we're starting the planning um, in earnest now. So if anyone wanted to help us out with um, uh, kind of solidifying some sessions or, um, you know, otherwise um, uh, volunteering for some of the committees to help plan us make this um, a wonderful in-person conference, please reach out to um, Greg, um, Stephen, or um, anyone on the board. We would love to have you uh, join us and help out. Uh, then the um, next session that we're going to do online, though, is scheduled for June 20th. So if, um, unfortunately, this one, when it went out, it didn't have a calendar invite, but we'll tr I'll try to do a reminder and an invite for this, for that time, um, that will be focused more on, um, fall planning and kind of, um, updating people on where, where they're at. Um, so as I mentioned, there was a CI user group session today, and I wanted to do a couple um, updates as well from um, the NACS side, which we um, are, if you're also a NACS Storm member, I just saw in the email that there was um, their NACS Leadership Institute applications will be opening next week. Um, as a previous um, attendee of the NACS Leadership Institute, I would strongly encourage you or your staff to check it out as um, some professional development training because it was really um, instrumental in my um, learning the industry more and making um, connections and things. So um, if you want more information, um, I believe they sent that out this morning, but you can always reach out um, to NACS to learn more about that. And then they, as it was mentioned at the conference, as well as um, recently they've, um, uh, with the campus store standards that's been released by CAS, if you are currently a member, there's a way that you can download the store standards for free. And Brent at CEI also did, um, did a session with um, Jeff Nelson. So um, if you'd like to see that recording, that was, I think, a, um, a couple months ago, you can rent, you can contact Brent BD at bbd at campusebookstore.com for that recording and then he was happy to share with you if you want more context of what the standards are and how they came to be um, also upcoming um, the textbook affordability conference is happening in november and next is um, has a has a website to be able to um, um, i guess get updates for for that uh, which uh, is something that I'm hoping I can make make work to be able to attend this year. Um, and also next university that they offer um, online classes and training and sessions. Um, I'll put that link in the chat as well. If you're currently a next member, they have some other sessions that um, uh, you can uh, direct your staff to do on um, store operations and merchandising, which I find, um, you know, sometimes it's good to know that there's other resources available to you. Um, as well, ICBA is holding um, some meetings that are store to store and buyer to buyer. I believe you have to be an ICBA member to attend those, but they sent an email out with the dates of that recently this week. Okay, so um, the focus of today's meeting is sort of to open it up for discussion and uh, um, sort of find out what, what, what stores are currently doing, if there's any changes and um, uh, updates that we want we want to share with the group or find well, my favorite thing is always sourcing those um, hard to find items um, but today we are start, sort of uh, okay I'll start off with the question um, one of the things that we did uh, around this time last year was hold um, sessions with each of the digital um, digital content um, or service providers or like you know the vendors that uh, that aren't necessarily the publishers, but deal with digital materials. And so one of the questions we were curious about was, is anybody going through a change where they've switched providers or doing pilots with something that, you know, sort of maybe um, would like to update the group on or if, how it's going since we know the players are usually uh, vital source, um, uh, Willow Labs and some other, um, like I think we also invited um, CEI um, at the time Red Shelf, and I think there was another one. I can't remember the name of them, but there, there's different providers that offer that. So I like to open it up if anybody would like to jump in, and 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 share a project that they might be working on, or if you have changed providers since we talked about it last year. Ah, slingshot. That's right. Thanks, Kevin Brown. Go ahead, Sam. 
Yeah, I'll, I, I will share uh, kind of what happened with our attempt at a project since the conference. Um, so at the conference, I met Reckon and Julie from the Willow team. Um, and after the conference, I proceeded to meet with them several times. So, and sorry, I should have mentioned Lakeland College. Um, so we are a, probably a small school, I would say. Maybe not an extra small category, but definitely small. Um, so we've been using CEI, and we, we appreciate Brent and his team. However, we're having some issues with the usability from the student side and accessing the content. So that's where we were hoping to move to Willow. Um, I met with them several times, had several discussions with them, brought in our LMS team, had discussions. Um, we had a contract that had gone up that was being worked on on the Lakeland end. And then they very abruptly ended the process with us, um, stating that we weren't a big enough school and we didn't have big enough volume for them to take us on. Um, since then, I've talked to some other small schools and found out there are significantly smaller schools using Willow. Um, so I'm a bit, I would be curious if every, anyone in this group has any insight as to potentially why they would have abruptly stopped that conversation. Kevin. I actually uh, had a conversation with them too, because I'm hoping, because I heard so many good things about Willow. So I was, I reached out during the conference saying, hey, uh, how can we, you know, work together? And uh, so I had a meeting with them. Um, they in the meeting, they asked me what exactly I'm looking for. So they said no. And uh, until you guys are, you know, uh, looking into the uh, uh, inclusive course material, we're not really interested. I was like, oh, okay. That was five minutes. That was it. So I actually on the same boat with you. That's interesting, Kevin. Because so I so like I said, several meetings. Like engaged with multiple stakeholders at Lakeland, I stated up front that we're not doing inclusive access and that it's probably not going to come to Lakeland anytime soon. Um, and it wasn't until that final meeting where they shut it down that they said, if you consider inclusive access, we would reconsider your school. But it wasn't like a sure thing, if you do inclusive access, we'll take you on. Melissa? Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, so we had a meeting with um, the gentleman from Willow as well. And then they we said, you know, we were going to go ahead with looking into it. We're still sorry. I'm from Mohawk College as well. And um, they want us to get into inclusive access, but we're having an issue behind the scenes with getting Mohawk on board with doing inclusive access. So we had to, next, you know, we're getting an, an invite from, I think you said it was Julie. Um, and we're like, we didn't say we wanted to proceed with this. We're still looking into other avenues. Um, so we had to cancel that meeting. But then we found out that Willow works with Follett. And we were like, yep, yeah, nope, we're not doing it. So we, we've we totally scrapped doing it. And we are going to do access advantage rather than inclusive access. I think probably Carrie had her hand up and then Kevin afterwards. Oh, Carrie, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Carrie, I don't. Sorry, my Google is being really weird. So my chat function is not working at either. So if I repeat anything that somebody's already thrown in the chat, I apologize. I can't see anything. Um, but um, I was actually going to throw in the chat to tag Sean because I'm too far away from him to poke him. But Sean, do you want to share? Um, some of our recent experiences with Willow, because as, as some of you on the call may know, like we've been with Willow for many, many, um, many, many years and have been quite avid supporters of them until more recently. So, Sean. Yeah, um, I actually did just put a quick comment. I, this is working, right? Because my speakers weren't working too. Okay. Um, I did put a comment that, yeah, at the U of L, we don't use an IA. We have a single payer model. Um, it originally was kind of an IA. But I think uh, back, was it latest April, early May, something like that, I had sent out the note that, yeah, um, we don't hear back from them like we used to. We don't seem to get the same kind of contact from them. And, you know, the, the main thing that I had heard was, you know, there's a lawsuit between Norton not being paid by Willow. So Norton's not su supporting their materials in our system, which one of them is actually one of our longest running ones, or one of our cinema classes has used it 
since 2014, I want to say. Um, so that created a panic. And then a week and a half later, it was all cleared up. But yeah, some of the, so, some of the digging, it was a little strange. Um, Melissa, you mentioned the Follett connection, which is definitely in, um, it, I was going to say back of our minds, but it's in the front of our minds most of the time now. Um, I'm also finding that the communication is different. We don't seem to hear back the same way. Um, and just recently we've had, a, had them reach out asking to kind of speak to us, uh, about opportunities and things like that. We don't know what that is. And they've asked for these weeks. It's not going to work at all. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of par for the course, but I'm really surprised. I, I mean, I do know that they want the IA, but we haven't been pushed the same way. Nevertheless. Um, yeah, we, we, we've had some questions about things that we've been doing with them and, you know, we're exploring. I'm shocked to hear them tell other schools that they don't want to work with them at all. That's, that was just bizarre to me because I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, Sam, Kevin. I'm sorry. That's a big red flag to me yeah. too. And and the other thing that was really interesting is um, we found out, of course, from Norton that uh, about the, the issues with potentially not being able to have their materials available through our integration for the summer sessions. And then that quickly got resolved. But Willow didn't contact us at all to give us any heads up that this was going on. All the contact we had that we might not be able to distribute in, in our regular way was from directly from Norton. And then at the same time that Sean was getting all those messages about distribution, I was getting emails from Julie and Megan asking me to provide testimonials for on behalf of Willow. Um, so I don't know, like, there's something very desperate about the, the timing of everything. So it's throwing up a lot of red flags for us, honestly. Um, so we, we started definitely um, very aggressively looking towards, um, towards other solutions at this point. Kevin Brown, you have your hand up next. So I guess if you're going to write that testimony, I'll have to put an asterisk die. As long as you can pay uh, or, 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 okay. um Yeah, when we were, so... Madeline and I, I know we've talked about it. we went through an RSP process. Just we had a lot of different. We were CI. We were using Kubuto as our main distributor. Uh, um, Vital Source was our secondary, and we were just wanting to see. We were, we were at the point where we thought that we'd come as far as what we had got. Like my my 2000 Honda Civic that is like last legs and like I increased the value of the car every time I filled up the tank. It was exactly like that. It had gotten, we'd got our use out of it, but we're needing something better. So um, going through the RFP process, it was very interesting because it was, we got to see everyone and what they were doing and everyone can make things look great for 30 minutes. Like it's, for, for a presentation, but it was very telling um, uh, request for proposals. Uh, so we were putting our primary, sorry, I just saw that question in the chat there for what is an RFP. Um, we put a request out for our vendors to, uh, to submit proposals to uh, become our primary vendor. Um, it was very telling because we were looking for a digital solution, but also something that was going to help improve our, our, our e-reader experience as well. Um, just we've had a lot of accessibility issues. Um, a lot of students who are uh, having requests to come through our accessibility department and looking to service them better. And it was very interesting when Willow was like, we're, we're, not, an, we're not an e-reader company. We had, like, we've got a basic e-reader. It was very interesting from that because it was like, yeah, we're, we want your business, but we're not changing anything for that. But um, I think, Sam, what you're running into is that the IA programs, they have a very high revenue stream for them. You're, you're having a, if it's a mandatory program or an opt-in, opt-out, you're having 80 to 90 to 100% of your students getting purchases through that. So with their commission rates, I think it's just whether they're seeing that their manpower just isn't there enough that they can, they want to divert it where they can make more money or what have you. Um, yeah. Uh, what we had for our RFP process was um, we went in thinking that Will was going to be the leader and it was Vital Source came to the plate. They have taken over our business as our, our, our primary one. Uh, the trip, full transition is starting in the fall. 
but a lot of our, our publishers were very interested to, were very happy for us to switch over to vital source just they've got such a great e-reader um, the back end systems are very very simplified as well um, as well as just they are working on that same similar integrations as what willow has that has the the codeless experience into a into a coursework platform um quick feedback from that right now is that it is just starting out with some publishers in the states so for example sengage is just starting into the states with the vital source they are wanting to get it out and running um i'm not sure when that's going to come up into canada but talking with sengage canada they're, they're working with us to find solutions to to simplify our user experience so whether it is through the digital solution provider or directly we're figuring that out but it's it's been an interesting experience to say the least well thanks kevin shannon you had your hand up yeah so um red flags you know the guy who runs through the fields with the big red flag like that's what i'm seeing in my head right now if you know you know um uh so i definitely disappointed we just finished the extraordinary long process of getting them approved to use on campus through it and security and privacy and all the rest of this we literally last week at uh, the end of last week just got them integrated with our d2l brightspace um lms and um and have just been kind of trying to wait to make sure all of the other integrations work with with bookware and whatnot and then yesterday our um learning um teaching and learning center sent a note to willow and cc me and said what about this security flaw that's recently been raised um and it's about i can send this out somehow it's like i have a pdf i don't think i can attach them in the chat but it's about um uh it's called the one ed tech advisory on the use of lti shims for tool integration so shims lti i don't know what any of this means so they sent that out to um to willow and willow brecken said i'll send it to uh uh an engineer and the engineer responded the engineer never addressed shims in the response so i don't actually know if it if the response is adequate to so so what i'm trying to say is now i've got a security issue that's been raised here on willow so i just want to make you guys aware that that's um there's some talk about this and so uh ed tech advice so if you google probably ed tech advisory on the use of lti shims for tool integration i will copy that into the chat somehow oh this is a non-copyable pdf Okay, anyways, I will do that in a second. I just want to let you guys know that that's a potential issue. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, where does this leave us, right? Oh, Brent, thank you, Brent. That's awesome. Easy. So there it is. And um, uh, I think this uh, this whole whether or not don't want to work with small schools, like we're fully student pay, but I also have 33,000 students here, right? And and so I can say like, this is how we're going to do it. And they probably just want to get our business, right? Because they know it's a foot in the door. But I'm really concerned if that's how they're treating the Canadian market, our small schools are being, oh, you're not like, it's not worth it for us to deal with you. That's a big, that's a big issue. But it leads me to think like, where does this leave us as an industry? Um, so CEI, I love their mission, vision, values. I love what they they want to do. And I just unfortunately don't think they're doing it well enough. And you guys have heard me talk about, you know, we just can't continue to have the tech issues and the user experience that we currently have um, with them. Uh, and then, you know, vital source. Um, I don't know, are they sort of the only kick at the can? Uh, yeah, Kevin, you're exactly right. They haven't kept up with the market. They haven't kept up with customer expectations um, and how even just in, in user experience, right? UI, UX, and neither is Cavuto. Interesting, I've never used Cavuto. So is, you know, is is VitalSource the only kind of game left in town? Is anyone doing codes through VitalSource, access codes? We're only ever done eBooks through them. So I'd love to hear what other people think about like, where does this leave us, right? In the Canadian market. And, and if it's just CEI, is there, you know, is there a way, how do we support that? Is there, what do we do to try to help that get better kind of thing? So I'll stop talking and rambling now. 
I don't have a response on how to solve the world's problems, and I'm not sure if anybody else does, but feel free to jump in. Uh, Natalie, you also have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to share a bit of my experience as an extra small school, <laughs> uh, maybe the one of the smallest. Um, and uh, so we have used Willow so far, um, and uh, I haven't heard anything from them, any indication that we're too small or we need to start moving to IA or anything. Um, so they haven't expressed that at all. Um, and then, uh, sorry, one, one moment. Um, and then, uh, so I've been moving to Vital Source. Um, I tested it out this spring. I didn't tell Willow <laughs> as far as they know. Hey. Are still using them um but there was one i've had some issues of different books that i don't have distribution rights to um and they especially because we're so small it's very difficult to get that access um and so there was one title i actually like they uh it's a new pearson book a new edition and i couldn't get it from vital source at all so i i went back to willow for that um but yeah, it's mostly the distribution rights that has been very difficult um, with Vital Source. But otherwise, so it's kind of rock in a hard place. They're they're equally <laughs> causing issues for me. But um, so far, I'm Vital Source is a bit more promising. Thanks, Natalie. Kevin Brown, you have your hand up. Sure. Uh, I was just gonna say, like I. It, I, it's a common theme from what I'm hearing from people here. It's just when you're not happy where you're at, uh, and it's exactly where we were. Um, I can tell you, I can share an email chain back and forth that I had with Cavuto where I was bringing up a very minor issue that was causing so much support issues for us each term and on their end as well. And it was two and a half, three years before I actually had them give and address it and like acknowledge and like try to start working on it. But at that point, like when you've had that been wronged for so long, it just makes it harder to, to, okay. Yeah. Well, if you're going to make a minor adjustment at this point. Um, so at that point, that's when we started that RFP process. So it was just a nice, look. we, we can change. We don't necessarily need to, but let's see what else is out there. So that, it, it's really inviting everyone else to show you what's there. It was very eye-opening because we could see what else was there. We were already working secondary with Idol Source at that point, but it was very interesting to see what capabilities were out there. And it just opened us up to, oh, we don't have to struggle with that again. Um, like distribution rights, I found with publishers, a lot of them are just... Uh, maybe it's just for our inclusive access program but they have been very willing to work with us no matter which public or which provider we're with it's really yeah uh, we, we want to get you the books we want to get the money in our, our bank accounts as well so um they're like, just let us know where you want it and we'll put it there so it's been very helpful that way uh, but yeah i know that sometimes some of the some of the smaller publishers will balk at commission rights and stuff like that from a vinyl source or a willow or something like that. It, it can make it a little bit more of a challenge, especially in the student pay side. So it might be, I'm not saying no IA, but it's, it, it has definitely helped with, a, it gave us a bit more leverage with the publishers as well. Thanks, Kevin. Stephanie, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, so at Western we use CEI and we're just in the process of adding on vital source right now. So one thing I've been um, thinking about and need to figure out with vital sources, once I get the invoice, how to compare it to make sure that invoice is accurate. Um, just with CEI, we always compare our invoices from the publisher to our campus e-bookstore download. Um, and one vendor does overbill us every month. So we have to be pretty um, careful with that. Um, with vital source, I think they bill on behalf of all of the publishers. So I'm thinking I'll just run a, a sales report from, from bookware and compare it to our invoice. But if anybody has any kind of tips on that, um, I would be interested to hear about it. Thank you. 
Great. Um, Sean Bell, your hand's up. Um, it was actually just seeing sort of in the chat from Melissa, she's mentioned Access Advantage, and I don't recognize that name. So I'd like to know a little bit more. Uh, but just before I call her in, I just also wanted to mention uh, the reluctance with IAEA. There's, there is a push in other uh, sectors, uh, student unions, for example, some libraries, that sort of thing, have been feeding a lot of misinformation or disinformation about it. I think that's where it depends where your administration's hearing it. Um, I've, I've seen some really egregiously out, out of whack um, articles on it and things like that, that is, it's clearly conflating, and the one I saw it was actually conflating leasing situations with Follett and Barnes and Noble to an IA program, which no, th th those two are related, but they were turning it into some sort of the bookstore is going to make massive bank off of it and the students will sell. It's a really weird track with all those. So yeah, we've, we've had that when the mention of IA comes up around here, our student union, just red flags went up for them. We're back to red flags. Um, okay. And then back to my first question, if Melissa, if you can explain a little bit on what is access advantage, I don't recognize that one. Uh, so I put it in the chat that I actually got the information from Darren who got it from Fanshawe. So I don't know if anybody from Fanshawe is on the call today. Um, I don't want to steal their thunder. <laughs> yes. Hi, Francois. Can you hear me? Yeah. So this is CI. Uh, it's Brent Beattie that calls it uh, access advantage. And uh, it's a uh, it's a opt in system. So it's similar to the permalinks that they have. It's a bit better, but it's embedded in the in your learning management system, and uh, students can buy it straight from uh, from the LMS. Uh, there was supposed to be some uh, fourteen days uh, fourteen day free access. We're, we're just doing it for the first time this spring, so we're just starting. We have about uh, eight titles. But uh, we managed to get better prices from Pearson. Uh, Cengage didn't want to budge on it, but we got a better price pricing, better discount. But we couldn't, for some reason, at the very end, not get the 14 uh, free access code because that would have, this would have been a, a big plus for us to, we believe, to encourage students to you know, use the free code for 14 days and then buy it from us, but they couldn't. So they essentially, they have to buy it. That's what it is in a nutshell. And if you need more information, you can contact Grand BD at CI. It's a fairly simple system. So, Thank you, Francois. Shannon, you have your hand up again. I just have a question for Francois. Is the, you, the fact that you couldn't get um, your 14-day free access to your students, was that a CEI tech issue or was that on Pearson's side? I think it's uh, on Pearson's side Pearson's because side? for a long okay. time, I thought we were going to get it. Brent thought we would. And I was surprised what we could, why we couldn't. And this is something I have to look into later because pretty much any title from any publisher, you can get the 14-day uh, free access code. Whether you have inclusive access or not, or you know, you're doing yeah. your hours, yourself. So I just couldn't believe why we couldn't get it. So this is something I have to look at because this got set up fairly late uh, in April. So we just had to get on with it. And uh, But yeah, I was, I was frustrated about it, I'll be honest. Yeah. No, I think it's, I, it, it's a great, it, the, it sounds like a really good alternative. Um, uh, if, if all the parts can get working like that, the access advantage. So it, it's another, it's another great program. So I'll be following your program. I hope you keep reporting back on it, Francois. Well, I was told the ones that are already doing it is Douglas College in, uh, in New oh. Westminster and uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. Okay. And I'm told it goes very well. This is from Brent, but uh, they were the first one. They were ahead of us. Uh, they've been doing it probably since probably at least last winter. So we're like the third one doing it. Okay. Is anyone here from those schools who can just wants to talk to it? I see Mike has his hand up. Ah, uh, there we go, Mike. Um, <clears throat> this is the first time actually hearing about access advantage. We're not actually a part of it. Um, Brent briefly mentioned something to me at the conference when I chatted with him, saying that if you can get like eighty or ninety percent buy-in, then publishers may be willing to give you a better rate. 
I mean, that was kind of like the next logical step uh, from kind of the uh, the method we were pursuing to try to gather more CEI sales. So I we haven't actually signed on or heard about anything Access Advantage West. That's just us at Douglas College. I believe there was a presentation of schools in the U.S. I feel like Oregon was one of the ones that's doing this. So if you also want to find out more information, I'm sure Brent can share the link for that, um, that one. That's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there was something pre presenting, but basically, uh, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you have a way to insert the permalink, but like have it where it's already in the LMS, and then the students purchase through that way, because th that's the tricky thing that I find is like, how do you collect the payment if it's not linked to your POSs, like that kind of stuff. So I know that there's all those logistics to work out. So um, I'm so sorry, Sean, Val, no, you have your hand up. So. Okay. Um, there's just some questions here, and it just kind of follows from a Francois had mentioned that what I'm finding, someone it, it had kind of come from somewhere. Was it all publishers? I'm finding of all of them, Pearson is the most IA forward, digital forward. Uh, in a recent presentation, the CEI one that I was in on Tuesday, I know that there's one in like 20 minutes or something like that. They uh, Vanessa had mentioned that they've kind of already got their pricing in place. They're kind of ready to support, however. Meanwhile, we were dealing with Cengage books through our Willow integrations, and all of a sudden, they don't want to do two-week trials. Like, they're just, we're finding some like Cengage and McMillan are just trying to slam the brakes on things that we're trying to do. We had a whole lot of issues with McMillan last fall, so we're really reluctant with them, um, which I know I've, I've mentioned it before in other contexts that, you know, Pearson is working with us far better than other publishers, which is historically not how we expect things. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm finding that some are better than others and Pearson is actually the ones thinking the most of the different ways we can do things. Like they're prepared with pricing, depending what you're doing and they've got these all loaded, however you want to set them up. It's a little different than Cengage who just sent me emails, uh, I want to say in April that they don't do the two week free trials through the Willow integrations. Like that's been part of it is yeah, they get the two week. And then they can purchase in, but they only do that for when they're using their coursewares. They won't do that with the eBooks anymore. So we have to set things up completely differently for them, which is new. Um, so it just, it, it's a small thing. Uh, Stephanie, I also wanted to mention when you are asking about vital source, we get things uh, by commission. So they sell through a white label store. I don't know if that's how you're doing yours. So yeah, they just send us, you can do the reports in their manage section and you can pull and they'll actually send those out. I get them usually within a few days at the beginning of a month, and then you actually get the payment information and you can compare what you've sold, but you can also pull your reports to see what you've got. And it seems to work out to about 10 to 15% commissions, which isn't bad for mostly just putting in a link, essentially, so. Like a the active origin paper. Thanks, Sean. Kevin Brown, you're next. I need to get frequent flyer miles for this. Um, I put in the chat, uh, Brent, I had a, I had the recording for his session one. He was talking about this access advantage, which um, Oregon State, they had called it, uh, they had keyframed it uh, Ottawa Access, and they were an independent school, or sorry, an independent uh, third party bookstore. Um, so they weren't actually related to the school. Um, I had the, I had the video recording for it, but apparently Brent has deleted it from Zoom. So I would share that note with you if I had it still, but, um, it seemed like the recording was, it was a great resource and if, or for doing a IA light kind of thing, if you didn't have the system integrations or didn't have the capabilities on it. So if you didn't have a registrar's office that was willing to do billing, um, if you didn't have an IT program that was willing to integrate with a, with a provider like that can deliver items right through the LMS, um, it did seem like a lot of work where you were pulling spreadsheets of an element data to, to give to that link to do this. It was, I was, I jumped on it because I was interested. It was very, interesting but it seemed like it was a step back from what we were doing um it was and it seemed like it might be a good advantage for if you don't have some to be able to but um yeah just wanted to play uh, that, 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 that 
Go ahead, Francois, or did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, regarding virtual source, uh, there are two things, uh, Charles. There is the white label store, you're right, but you can have an integration. We have both of them. We have the virtual source integration in Bookware. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it works similar to CI. That means you can have a, a vital source ebook or a CI ebook on different courses and students buy it. And it's exactly the same uh, buying process. If they buy it online, they get an email with an access code. I would say vital source is more straightforward than CI, the way it works. But essentially, sometimes I cannot get the title from CI, so I have to get the vital source title and vice versa. Uh, Luan, you have your hand up. So I've been interested in the advantage access as well. Um, but the permalinks that are using the white label store for uh, to go directly to CEI, I'm just wondering why you wouldn't supply a link to your own website and that course and then have the student click right into the bookstore because that's where my thinking and my cart goes and I've mentioned on these calls before like I think every course shell in all of our schools should have a buy my textbook button that is linked directly back to your bookstore and so we're very close to having our single sign in but once that's there if I can get that link in Brightspace for every course for every student then they just the only place they need to look is to click there and come to the bookstore and they can get CEI I don't have the vital source integration yet, but we have a white label. It sounds like it's working for you guys. So that's probably the next step for us as well. Um, yeah. So does anybody have an answer to that? Like, why are they pushing the, the early access to be just the kernel likes directly through CEI? Was that to facilitate better pricing with the publishers? If it's more of a consolidated CEI is buying this much every month, I wonder. Um, and it is interesting for me to hear, sorry, there's a heat up behind me that's so loud. I feel like I'm shouting and I apologize if I'm spitting that way for you guys. Um, the two week free trials. I mean, our school was doing those for all first year sciences for about 10 years now um, through Pearson. So I need to reach out and find out if they're still doing those on a course by course basis or as a company if they've given them up because I thought that was the perfect, the link would be there to buy it from the bookstore and they would have their free trial, so they only had to buy it once they were settled in the course. So, interesting. Thank you, everybody who's contributing. I so, see. You know why the links? Like, like, did you explore it as to where the Pearl link might be better than our own website? Well, Anna, I think what... I think what you're going to see is that um, a lot of the talk was having it in the LMS would have it so that it's right in front of where the class is actually operating. So um, it also helps you isolate it so that um, if they were using a MyLab link or a Connect link where they're, it's also for sale there, it's at least keeping it internally. So you're, you're having the sales rather than trying to compete with everywhere else. So whether it's Amazon or that publishers directly, you're at least still capturing it that way through the LMS then. Go ahead, Francois. Well, uh, Luan, uh, our original strategy, and that's why we thought it would be better with the uh, access advantages, students would have access on day one of the free trial. And then at the end, near the end of the free trial, they would start getting emails, a bit like an inclusive access or whatever. And okay, now it's time to buy your access code or you'll lose access to it. And then they can click here and buy it without, uh, before ac in, uh, access advantages, you could put the permalink, it's in there and students buy it if they want or not. That was it. So the, that's why the free trial was such a big deal to me. It's basically you give 100% of the students have access on day one. So they're already using it. And then at the, by the end of the second week, they start buying it, which was better. We didn't get that first part. I guess, do, does anyone else have any questions about um, digital delivery or anything else to add um, before I change topics? 
questions. Um, one of the things I was curious about was whether we have any, um, uh, so sometimes it, it's funny, like, you know, we, we get together, we, we chat about things that we realize that, hey, um, some stores are experiencing the same issues across Canada, but we never talk about this. So are there any vendors that we're having trouble with, either publishers or um, merchandise vendors that maybe if there's um, some issues that we need to to raise as part of CSC to um, to bring that to the vendor, um, not as a this is bad, but just any any concerns that we have, just because I know that sometimes after the show, um, like, you know, we've ordered things and some things are not as expected. And so I just wanted to open up the floor if there's any concerns that anyone wants to raise, um, because I found out one, but I'm not going to name names. So then I'm just, I'm just going to look at um, if you have any um, concerns with um, vendors or if you actually, if you have any shout outs for good vendors too, we'll, we'll also have that. Mel, that name names. Who who's who are you having trouble with? Nope, I'm not gonna say. Okay, I I would I'll I manage. I'll, I can start the conversation. Um, Coco Berry was at the show, uh, and they had a beautiful booth. Um, and we're really struggling with them. So we placed our order in February. It was supposed to be delivered in March. Uh, then it was supposed to be delivered in April, and now it's May. Um, and uh, anyways shipping stock issues all the rest and now it looks like um decoration problems so they caught garments before they sent them to us but we're a little bit nervous judging by the quality of what we saw in the pictures of the embroidery so we're hoping that the garments are okay and they caught the only bad ones right we still haven't seen them even though we were supposed to have by now um and our hope is if the garments are good and they sell okay, we'll just buy them blank and decorate them locally because um, we have a great relationship with an embroiderer, embroiderer here locally. But um, they've been weird to deal with. And we're not sure if it's just because they aren't used to dealing with our market. And maybe when they deal with like clothing vendors, it's different. But um, yeah, so yeah. Um, Anyways, so Sam said, yeah, that's why she hesitated. We had we placed a pretty small first order. We wanted to see how they would do, and, and we'll still get the chance to do that. I'm really, really hopeful that the, I mean, the garments were gorgeous at the show, so let's see how they do in the store. So that's my, my feedback. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Thanks, Shannon. Go ahead, Luann. So that's interesting. I know the Marine Institute has received their shipment and they were quite pleased with them. I haven't seen them in person, but I was talking to Kim a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've been back and forth and back and forth with them. We placed a large order, so <laughs> red flags, red flags. Um, however, they were going to embroider and they came back to us because our order was significant enough that they're going to do that rubber lettering as it was at the show. Um, so at the show, the minimum for that was very, very, very high. And they brought it down to the point that our order met that expectation. So ours aren't due until the end of July. We're still in, you know, the waiting mode. There were some colors that we changed up and that kind of stuff. So I hope, but I must say they've been very responsive and we've had a very open dialogue and everything seems to be on track. So I'll let they, you guys know if anything turns out. They tried to get us to switch to that. And they were like, hey, do you want to do this? And I was like, well, we don't really. We just want the garments. Like, And it felt like they were trying to slow because it felt like it was an excuse to not get us our garments when they promised. They that were like, oh, switch to this new type of thing. It'll take longer, but it's this new thing. And I, we were like, mm, no, we just like, please just embroider them and send them to us. Right. And so, um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to hear, see Luann kind of like how they do and, and what those, those look like. Stay tuned. Carrie Tanaka, please go ahead. Um, yeah. So our story is similar to Luann's with Coco Berry, where um, it's taken us a little while to get our order together. It is more significant than what we initially wanted because we actually did want that rubber, that rubberized treatment to it. And originally their minimums were, were too high for that. Um, but now apparently they found a Canadian vendor that can do that same treatment. So they've lowered their minimums. Um, but yeah, with like color issues and stuff, they're not able to fill, fulfill a lot of the colors. So we've managed to split our order between a spring order and a fall order, like fall color palettes and combine them into one order, but they're going to hold shipment of the fall ones until they have a complete order to send us. Um, we haven't received our spring order yet, but that's, um, that's not on them. That's a, that was a lot of back and forth on us and us being like very 
particular about what we wanted. They have been very responsive. I'm, I think we're getting the feeling that they were a bit overwhelmed by the response that they got from that show, <laughs> um, which is good. I think that's a good problem to have. And I think that's a good, um, a good sign for Campus Stores Canada that a new vendor came in and is maybe feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the or the, the quantity of orders that they've received. So I'm still hopeful that they'll be able to to work things out. Um, interesting, Shannon, that you said that they're having difficulty with the embroidery because when we initially when they initially told us we needed a bigger minimum to get the rubberized printing, we said, okay, that's okay, we'll just switch to embroidery. And then they said, oh no, we don't do embroidery. <laughs> so we're like, oh, so that makes sense. Maybe they maybe they couldn't do embroidery well enough to want to continue with that. So so that's why they um they were really working with us to get the rubberized print that we originally wanted anyway. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm still holding out hope that uh, that they'll be able to deliver, but I'll let you know, we're expecting hopefully our order to arrive within the next uh, couple of days here. So we can certainly report back on the quality. Um, I would love to give a big shout out. We just did a rush order with, um, well, it wasn't really a rush order. We asked if he could turn an order around for us really quickly with Niagara River um, Trading Company. Um, and they delivered like they they turned it around for us really quickly their product looks beautiful it feels beautiful um the only caution that i would give if anybody's looking at uh, that ordering from them if you haven't already is all the pictures that we took at the show um where his booth was located must have been under a very like particularly yellow light um, because we wanted an, an exact replica of something that he had at the show which in all of our photos and in our memories looked like a powder blue hoodie with a, a blue and kind of buttery yellow treatment on it. Um, that actually doesn't exist. It's actually more of a, of an indigo blue with a, with a blue and white treatment on it. There's no butter. Yellow did not exist in the original at all. Sean, we can't see it because, Oh, there he, Sean's holding it up in his picture. So, um, they really easy to work with, really quick turnaround, really, really good pricing, um, especially for, and really good shipping rates, especially for those of us out, uh, out West. Um, so give, I'll, I want to give a shout out to him because he was one of the, the little guys, um, at the show. Um, and we did place an order with Lego as well that we haven't received quite yet, but, uh, but we'll report back on them too, because they were another new vendor, um, that we were dealing with. Wonderful. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, Luann, your hand is up. Sorry, guys, for all the talking today, but I'm going to pop. Um, I don't know. You've probably all got this, but you've heard me gripe about Ingram so many times. Uh, but it looks like we have a new Canadian representative. So I hope um, the relationship will be strengthened and maybe they'll be able to help us more with some of the challenges I know we have um, in ordering and getting stuff shipped properly to our location. So that's there. I don't know if any of the links, I can probably find the actual email addresses if somebody wants to reach out to me. Um, but I also, I know I'm conscious of the time and I don't know how many people are on this call. I actually have some sad news to share. I've been two days kind of reeling. I know Carrie was in St. John's in 2014 when we hosted the textbook uh, conference for CSC. I think it was the last textbook conference we ever had before things amalgamated. And I don't know how many others were on the call, but we had a very special guest speaker, Dr. Robert Shea, and his presentation and keynote was talked about in CSC for years later. On education committees, people would say, we need a guest speaker like Dr. Shea. And he was so appreciated and so engaged. And unfortunately, he passed away suddenly yesterday. And we're all completely heartbroken. Um, I will send Greg a message because Greg and I have had many conversations about him over the years and just how well he was received. So we're all a little sad down here these days. But I don't know if, Carrie, if you remember him and the presentation here at MUN or if there's anybody else. But um he he had gone on to become the vice president of the Marine Institute as well and had an impact on so many lives. And he always appreciated the bookstore. How many VPs come to the bookstore and give you a hug, right? That that was that was Rob. So we're going to miss him dearly. I do remember his keynote, Luann, and he was so supportive at a time when we really needed to hear that higher level support of all of us. So I'm so sorry for for you and your campus community. That's terrible.
Thank you for sharing, Luann. Um, Sam... Something positive, quick, quick, quick. Um, Sam, did you, want to, did you have a question, something to add? I, I can share, it's on a different topic. So um, if, if anybody else wanted to share before me, feel free. Go ahead. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, so I did place an order with Willand as well for the first time at the show. Um, so I did an assortment of backpacks and grad bears. And I kind of said like, okay, if I'm going to order for grad, these are definitely going to be here on time. Yep, absolutely. No worries. Um, our first convocation is May 31st. So I reached out maybe a couple weeks ago just to be like, hey, um, we haven't heard about the shipping yet. Where are we at? Um, and found out that they're not going to be ready in time, probably not going to be ready until the end of June. I will say uh, that was really disappointing and frustrating, but they've been good about dealing with it. So I replied back and said, I don't really have space for them if I'm not going to be able to sell them. So I don't really want them anymore. And they said, no worries. Um, we're just going to hold them for you. And then you can buy them from us next year if you want. And actually they gave me the option to not take them at all. So it it was frustrating, but I appreciate the response to that. Thanks for sharing. Go ahead, Stephanie. Um, I'll just share a new vendor that we're looking at. We haven't really brought them in yet, but Hype and Vice is uh, one out of the States and their um, product is very fashionable. So um, we've been excited to have a look at them. Great. Um, I'm just going to... Oh, go ahead, Sean. Sorry. Um, Stephanie, we had looked at Hype and Vice. How did you find the uh, coming around, getting across the border and stuff like that, charges and stuff like that? Because that was, that was one of our big flags for when we get stuff like that from the U.S. Um, I, we haven't actually brought them in yet, oh. so I'm not sure. If, I'm not exactly sure about that. But, uh, yeah, I could, I could check with our buyers and let, let you know. Okay. Yeah. Cause that, that was, that was probably our biggest hesitation with those is knowing what it can be like to get clothing across the border it can be tricky. <laughs> so. Um, I was just going to shout out a vendor I found here locally, um, because I was looking for some new pride items. They're called, um, oh, so can you see that proud zebra? Oh no, you can't see that. Why can't you see that? Um, this is the box, sorry. And they have like pins and different pride items. So I found them actually through a little store that they had um, um, uh, like these different customizable things. So if you, uh, they're not a CSC member, but I'm hoping that they would uh, want to join, but they are a small company. So that's something that I found um, for Pride Month that's coming up in June. Um, was there anyone else that like, would like to share? I know we have five minutes left before we're at the end of our meeting. And so if there's any topics that anyone would like to bring up. Go ahead, Shannon. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to put my board hat on it, and I just want to ask a super quick question here. Um, we all have homework. We're all working to try to make improvements here. And one of the things I've been tasked with is looking at um, community. And uh, we currently have, like, um, um, our member space, and we're trying to, trying to figure out how does that serve people and can we make it better and all of these different things. And so... I just want to ask a question in the most unorganized way possible. Um, I'm curious, realistically, if if there was if there was a way to make um, communicating with each other in like discussion format just uh, easier, would you actually use it? Um, and and try to think about like yourself in your day to day. But these kind of conversations, if you were um, if we can say like, hey, I'm having trouble with cocoa berry or or had a great order from Puka, take a look at these awesome hats. Like, is that actually something you're going to use or not? Um, so can you give a thumbs up if it's a yes and then maybe like a crying emoji if it's a no? You know, <laughs> to get to your emojis use. Okay, so people are saying, so if, okay, so because we all have full-time jobs. So if I put some effort into putting something together. You guys are going to cross your hearts, uh, promise to try it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so it's, it's still a ways away, but, um, but like, let's see if we can find a different, let's see if we can find a way to bring everything together and collaborate, um, 
I don't, I just didn't know if you actually wanted an online space or if everyone's happy with email. Like, so you guys have to tell us as, as members, like, what do you actually want to be using? If you just want to email one another, cool. If you want to have ways to communicate in more of a sort of, um, like a group sort of setting that we can also, we can also make that, that happen. And so we kind of have that in Google now, but I know some people feel like it's pretty disjointed and hard to navigate. So we're just trying to see what the options are. And I, we don't want to put in too much effort if everyone's like, meh, I don't need it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll see what's possible. No promises, but uh, yeah, we'll go forward from there. Um, speaking of which, I forgot to mention at the beginning that there is a YouTube channel, Stephen, that was going to share the link um, of all of the recorded sessions. So you could always come back to it if there was something that, you know, maybe was discussed. Um, but there is one part of, like there's the what's available and then what it need, you need to log in. So, yes, you do need to make sure that you're logged in to be able to view all the videos that are shared. Um, okay, we have two minutes left. Any last minute burning questions or else I can adjourn the meeting. And thank you so much for your contributions. I learned a lot and now like I, I'm so happy.